The midterm elections seem to have given us gridlock. The Republicans are likely to take control of the House. The Democrats are likely to retain the Senate, although several races are still too close to call and could take a little while to be resolved. This is largely in line with expectations, although if anything, the Republicans did slightly worse than had been anticipated. Under the prior makeup, the Democrats had both the House and the Senate, albeit with Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin maintaining the balance of power, thereby restraining the Democrats from some of their more ambitious pieces of legislation. This, of course, begs the question of whether gridlock, a divided Congress, is good for financial markets and good for the stock market in general. And in short, it really depends upon the exact makeup and exactly the policies of the parties. But at the moment, this is likely to be good for the market because it appears at the moment the Democrats want to bring in higher taxes, more spending, and have policies that are not particularly friendly to much of the energy production that we currently have and currently need. Hence why this is likely to be good news for the market. But when we evaluate this, we need to bear in mind that both A, the Republicans did worse than anticipated, which is a new piece of news for the market, and also B, the market had already factored into stock prices some of the impact of gridlock. So it makes it very difficult to just look at the market return on a given day. Now, when we're looking at this, we can't just look at what happened in the historical record. The reason for that is we need to compare cross-sectionally the policies the parties are advocating at each given point in time. We can't just look at how did gridlock perform over this time period versus this time period versus this time period. For much the same reason, as we can't look at how the market performed under this Democratic uh, president versus this Republican one versus this Democratic one because there are other global factors going on, there's other causality issues, and we need to compare at each point in time, cross-sectionally, how the two policies of the two parties compared. And at this particular point in time, the Democrats have significantly less market-friendly policies. And that's because they essentially want to increase taxes, increase spending, and their policies appear to not be designed to encourage greater energy supply. If we're looking at taxes, the Democratic administration has already flagged the idea of windfall taxes. They've increased taxes on share buybacks. This has been part of the Inflation Reduction Act. The 1% tax on share buybacks is not research-driven. It's not based on anything that is in any way analytical. It's based on an assumption that share buybacks are bad and that they deter corporate investment. But in reality, share buybacks are used when companies have excess cash that they're giving back to shareholders because those shareholders could do something better with the cash than keep it internally. This tax on share buybacks is a recipe for cash hoarding and therefore value destruction. It is not in any way empirically driven. Much the same as many of the other taxes that the Democrats routinely try to bring up, whether it's raising taxes on corporations or raising the tax rate on high income earning individuals or the wealth tax idea that routinely gets floated around. Many of these policies were part of the Build Back Better program which was, quite thankfully, discarded and didn't go anywhere. Now, these policies have not disappeared. It's just that they couldn't get them effectively through Congress. They couldn't get them through the Senate, in large part because people like Joe Manchin resisted them. Now, if the Democrats have control of the House and effective control of the Senate as well, they would be able to push through these policies that would increase taxes. Furthermore, they've shown a propensity to increase spending. An example of this is student loan forgiveness, which is effectively spending. It's fiscal stimulus, because it gives additional money to people who've had student loans. The problem with this, however, is that fiscal stimulus, when inflation is running above 8%, is a terrible idea. The Federal Reserve is trying to reduce expenditure within the economy. They are trying to stop inflation by increasing interest rates. If Congress, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level, goes out and gives people more money, that is entirely self-defeating and undermines what the Federal Reserve is trying to do. This applies mutatis mutandis to any other expenditure that is being done. Whether it's expenditure on the student loan forgiveness or expenditure on various forms of capital expenditure, such as was in the case in the Inflation Reduction Act. That is, to some extent, inherently inflationary. Then we have the energy supply issue. This is a concern. Clearly, we need to move at some point from fossil fuels through to renewables. But that needs to be done in an orderly manner. At the moment, we do need more oil to come to the market, albeit we will need to transition away from it. Now, clearly, if regulators are showing that they're going to clamp down on fossil fuel production, 
it is going to discourage capital expenditure. All the while, the president goes out and attacks oil companies, they're less likely to go and do capex because they know that they're going to lose their business in the future. Indeed, such was Joe Biden's disdain for the oil industry that in the 2020 election campaign, he threatened that there'd be no more drilling for oil and no more leases granted on federal land for oil companies. Number one, no more subsidies for fossil fuel industry, no more drilling on federal lands, no more drilling, including offshore, no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. However, now he's demanding that oil companies increase supply and is threatening oil companies with windfall taxes if they don't do so. It's unsurprising oil companies are reticent to increase supply when Joe Biden is on record of attacking those oil companies and threatening to decrease their production. His two comments are not in any way compatible. And this is why the energy policy under the Biden administration is such a mess. Now, under the current Congress, Joe Biden and the Democrats have been relatively unable to really get anything passed through to go after oil companies. And in large part, that's because of people like Joe Manchin in the Senate, who really holds the balance of power under the old Senate. He, of course, being in West Virginia, is in a state that has a lot of coal production, so is hardly going to go down the line of attacking oil companies. However, if the Democrats were to gain more control in the Senate and also retain control of the House, they would be able to bring in more policies that would attack oil companies while simultaneously wanting to increase supply in a manner that doesn't really make very much sense. This is why having a divided Congress here, that is, where we've got gridlock, is ultimately going to be better because it stops some of these policies really getting off the ground. Now, some actions require Congress's approval and some don't. Joe Biden can accomplish some things by executive order. An example is releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which because it's being used to manipulate down prices, is being nicknamed the Strategic Midterm Reserve or the Strategic Election Reserve. Now clearly that is short term, in that Saudi Arabia and OPEC Plus have more capacity to manipulate up prices than the US via the SPR has to manipulate down prices. Additionally, the SPR will need to be replenished. And if oil prices remain high, this will then become rather expensive. Nevertheless, more major moves, such as windfall taxes, are going to require more congressional buy-in, and many more severe things will need to go through Congress. So having gridlock prevents more severe draconian actions from being imposed. Now, by having gridlock, it prevents the Democrats bringing in more taxes. It prevents them bringing in greater spending. It prevents them from doing things that attack fossil fuel or energy companies. The gridlock effectively stops most policies from getting off the ground. It means that very little is going to get done. And given the policies that Joe Biden has flagged, this is the best case scenario for the stock market. Of course, there are a couple of caveats. The first one is that if gridlock gives rise to a fight over the debt ceiling, then that is generally not great for markets at that time. Debt ceiling fights are typically quite costly. However, the costs are often isolated at the time of the tumult and are often relatively short-lived. Risking a short-lived cost is less bad than risking the cost of negative harmful legislation that is then more difficult to remove. This is especially the case when that legislation involves tax hikes, which are notoriously difficult to reverse. The second caveat is that the market's initial reaction to this, that is what happens to the stock index on the announcement of this gridlock, is a little bit difficult to interpret because only new news moves markets. And if the market is already priced in gridlock to some extent, that is the Republicans taking clear control of one or both houses, then there's relatively little new news. And indeed, some of the new news might be that the Republicans did slightly worse than anticipated. So we need to be very careful about looking at the market's initial reaction to this election result. And we need to consider more thoroughly what the market had priced in compared to what had actually emerged. But overall, my perception is that this gridlock is good news for markets. It stops higher spending getting off the ground. It stops higher taxes being passed. It also stops particularly Decronian measures being brought in against fossil fuel companies precisely at the time when we need those companies to produce more energy to get inflation under control. Nevertheless, those are my thoughts on it. If you have any thoughts about this midterm result and about whether or not it's good news for markets, I would be interested to hear that in the comments below. 
And otherwise, thanks a lot for tuning in, and hopefully I see you for future videos as well.